Hi, everyone. We just opened up the webinar, so we see folks are coming in and we're going to give it a little bit of time before we get started. But I wanted to welcome everyone. Um, I, we're really excited about today. I think everyone's getting custom to this Zoom thing of you wait in the waiting room, you come in. So um, we're, it's always exciting from our perspective to see the numbers start climbing. We're just going to give it another uh, another half a minute or so till the numbers stabilize. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our next edition of On the Park Bench. Um, I'm Lynn Richards. I'm the president and CEO of the Congress for the New Urbanism. And we're really excited to be here today to present Equity First, uh, Resilience for Everyone. Today, we're gonna be hearing from Barbara Brown Wilson, Tatewi Means and Anna Clark. Uh, Mallory Batches will be moderating. But I wanted to jump on at the very beginning to talk a little bit about CNU membership. So um, you probably didn't realize that CNU does a lot of work um, outside of the Congress. Um, and a lot of that is funded and supported by your membership. So for example, on the park bench, this entire series, which we're so pleased to offer free and open to anyone is, is directly funded by CNU membership. And you know, we think it's really important to kind of highlight uh, members. So tonight, Today joining us is Dan Baisden and Jocelyn Gibson, um, two members representing the kind of newerish generation um, to talk a little bit about why they joined CNU and why they think it's important to be a member. So Jocelyn, do you wanna talk a little bit about your experience? That's right, thank you, Lynn. Um, so my first experience with CNU was at CNU 22 in Buffalo. And um, my department was getting recognized for our form-based code, but I was also there because I was writing for an urban news source at the time. And um, given that I was writing about the Congress, I had a great excuse to just go up and talk to people and ask the panelists and, and just ask different people about the work they were doing. And um, I ended up writing an article about Ben Hamilton Bailey. So I had the opportunity to get lunch with him and spend part of a day with him. Um, and it was really just sort of, I, I just kind of felt when I was there, like I was in proximity to a lot of really great ideas, really, people who are really doing innovative things. You know, while we were getting lunch, Enrique Penelosa sat down with us for a while, um, mayor of Bogota. And so I was just kind of in heaven. Um, and then fast forward to a few years later and we started a chapter in the Midwest. And I still feel that way about our Midwest chapter. Um, we just have so many really, smart, interesting people doing really interesting work. And I just feel very lucky that I get to be around them at our chapter events and I get to be sort of constantly learning from them. So um, I sort of, you know, since, since going to that first Congress in 2014, I've kind of been a member ever since. And um, I've gotten a lot out of it. And I think I'm a better professional for having, you know, for being part of CNU. So um, I'm joined here with my co-chair of the CNU Midwest chapter, Dan Baisden. And so Dan, I am curious, what first got you interested in CNU? Yeah, I was, uh, I first heard of CNU when it was in Dallas, uh, and then I wasn't able to attend at the time, but um, uh, it was in Detroit the next year, and so, uh, you know, a three-hour drive from where I'm located at in uh, northern Indiana, and I uh, uh, packed up in the car, drove to Detroit, and um, it, it, the reason I went and the reason I even got involved in CNU was because it talked about um, communities and urbanism and uh, good, good communities to live in and, and, and how to interact. And so um, I had no idea going into it what CNU was. And then I got there and uh, instantly just got hooked by the people and the conversations we got to have and the, and the relationships and the friendships I got to build and a few of the people I met right away. Um, we're on CNU staff and then also um, Jocelyn and uh, you, of course, and then uh, a few other people that are involved in our CNU Midwest chapter. So it was so, a really great opportunity. Dan and Jocelyn, so much has been written in the press about how the, the millennials, as a for example, aren't joiners, right? So if you're talking to a friend or a colleague, you know, we, we have to wrap up so the real the real the real webinar can begin. But if you were talking to a friend and colleague, what's the one sentence that you would tell them to join CNU? I would say it will 
you know, being, being involved in the organization, whatever you're consuming, whether it's the webinars or, you know, the publications, I think it, it will expand, expand your mind about your profession. That's what I would tell them. I think. Uh, and Dan? That's so hard to beat. That's a really good one. I would say um, it's a great way to connect with like-minded people who care about similar things that you do. And that's so hard to find sometimes in professional organizations, but CNU allows you to do that on a daily basis. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jocelyn and Dan. And for everyone else who's, who's here with us right now, um, please join CNU so you can continue to support um, programs like the on, on the Park Bench and that we can continue to offer it free and open to, to anyone. So Scott Shields, our membership manager, is standing by. Give, go ahead and give him a call at 973-714-7204 or go ahead to uh, www.members.cnu.org. Um, and of course, you know, uh, do it simultaneously while you're listening to this great webinar. So Mallory, I'm turning it over to you to, to moderate this amazing panel that you put together. And thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jocelyn. And thanks to everyone else for joining us today. Mallory. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. So yes, we're, Finally, ready to start off our, our webinar today after that, um, uh, after those um, great reflections by Jocelyn and Dan. Today's webinar is entitled Equity First Resilience for Everyone. And I'm really excited about the three women who are going to be speaking today. Barbara Brown Wilson is an associate professor of urban and environmental planning at the UVA School of Architecture and is co-founder and faculty director at the UVA Democracy Initiative Center for the Redress of Inequity through Community Engaged Scholarship, AKA the Equity Center. Her research and teaching focuses on the history, theory, ethics, and practice of planning for climate justice and on the role of urban social movements in the built world. Dr. Wilson is the author of Resilience for All, Striving for Equity Through Community-Driven Design, and co-author of Questioning Architectural Judgment, The Problem of Codes in the United States. Her research is often change-oriented, meaning she collaborates with community partners to identify opportunities to move our communities and the field of urban planning towards social and environmental justice. Anna Clark is a journalist who lives in Detroit. She is author of The Poison City, Flint's Water and the American Urban Tragedy which won the Hillman Prize for Book Journalism and the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award. Anna's writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Elle, Politico, the Columbia Journalism Review, Next City and other publications. She's also edited a Detroit anthology, a Michigan notable book, and is a contributing editor at Waxwing Literary Journal. Anna has been a Fulbright Fellow in Kenya and a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan. Finally, Tatewe Means, Tatewe is from the Sisseton, Wapatan, Dakota, Oglala, Lakota, and Ayangtanwan nations in South Dakota. She and her two children live in Rapid City, South Dakota. She grew up in Kyle, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. She received her Bachelor of Science degree from Stanford University in environmental engineering with a minor in comparative studies in race and ethnicity. She received a JD with a concentration in human rights law from the University of Minnesota Law School and a Master's of Arts degree in Lakota Leadership and Management from Oglala Lakota College. She served as Attorney General for the Oglala Sioux Tribe on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She also served as a German Marshall Fund Marshall Memorial Fellow in 2015. In 2018, she sought the Democratic nomination for South Dakota, South Dakota Attorney General the first ever indigenous woman to seek the office of a state attorney general in the United States. She's currently executive director of Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation, an indigenous nonprofit organization in the Pine Ridge Reservation, seeking liberation for Lakota people through language, lifeways, and spirituality. Quite a distinguished panel today. So I'm gonna start this off by handing it over to Barbara Brown Wilson. Barbara? Um, can everyone see my screen? We, we made the switch successfully. Thank you so much, Mallory, for that. I'm really excited about the conversation. Um, 
so excited that I probably have too many slides, but I'll try to go through them really briefly so that we can get to the um, to the good the good part because I'm honored to to be on this panel with these amazing women. Um, so when I think about um, uh, resilience, I this the you know right now the Gulf Coast is uh, getting hit by another storm at the moment. Um, in fact, it's come to my my yard too, um, and uh, and I think about this amazing piece of graphic advocacy um, produced when I was getting my doctorate. So I'm like deep, deep in thought about wh where my part of this, you know, um, of this work in this field should be. How can I contribute? And um, and they this group is using a um, a slogan that is a South African um, movement slogan. It's a disability rights slogan, and they're uh, they're using it actually um, to push back on uh, designers, planners like myself, like um, others who might have been involved through CNU, with uh, coming in from outside the region, saying, "Oh, you you know, you were just hit by this horrible hurricane, Katrina." we're gonna we're gonna make a good plan for you um and they said nothing about us without us is for us and um you know they often um continued this conversation we are the ones we've been waiting for if you're not um at the table you're on the menu these really poignant phrases that i wasn't hearing in my own professional um groups at the time i think that's changing and i'm really excited about that and so um so I'm trying to do my my part to help us get the tools we need and the frameworks we need to keep keep learning down down those uh, those ends. And I'm I'll try to stay big picture since we have two people that are really really knowledgeable about um, you know place based work uh, happening after. Um, so you know over 50 years ago now, uh, Sherry Arnstein gave us this you know heuristic of this of this ladder, um, and I did a study with you know self proclaimed community engaged um, designers uh, about five years ago about the methods they use and they're still pretty much all in this um, in this consultation range and you know for the most part people were using other types of of ways to share power and to figure that out in their work but but you know on average what, what they're really doing is um, is is what Sherry Arnstein would still refer to as a form of, of tokenism and so thinking through how we get to a version of shared power became a, a minor obsession of mine. And, um, and I really wanted to engage with the language of resilience in particular, partially because I really think these issues of climate um, and justice need, need to be in partnership. And, um, and resilience can be thought about three ways. It can be thought about as um, something that's more of an, an ecological mindset, right? That's where the language originally came from, and that's often about um, absorbing shock. Uh, a good, a good wetland, right, of, absorbs um, the shock of hopefully what's happening right now, Hurricane Zeta. Um, an e ecological, or excuse me, an engineering mindset where we're bouncing back, right? Um, but those are not appropriate terms when we're talking about. Um, systemic racism when we're talking about uh, the disproportionate impacts that have been happening to uh, people of color for generations. And so figuring out what uh, the language is that should be used that then informs our mindset, right, then informs the ways we make decisions in, um, in, our, in our professional discourses and how we share power towards those ends, how we share resources, how we break things open. Um, so I did a survey with a couple hundred practitioners, um, again, a, another round of surveys of, of people trying to map out the terms in the field, really just because when you write a book, you're trying to like help people understand and place themselves. And at first I was like, do I get a glossary together? Do I, you know, but um, language is fluid. And instead I wanted to represent through this work what people thought about the continuum of, um, of, of who's driving the project. Is it a professionally driven, project or a community driven project in terms of who gets to make decisions. And then, um, and then is it a uh, product oriented, right? What's the goal of the product? Is it, uh, or the, the project? Is it a product? Is it a, is it a really beautiful parklet? Um, or is, um, is the goal actually of the project about building capacity, which I think is, a, a, you know, self-determination, right? Like I get to choose. If my neighborhood improves and my property values rise, I get to choose if I stay or if I go, how I participate in neighborhood change. Um, 
they get to choose what that neighborhood change looks like, right? That that is to me um, where you know where the the field can be going if it's aspiring to engage with equity with civil rights. Um, and so uh, it's this bubble that concerns me the most um, when we could do a whole thing about the civil rights movement and the ways in which um, planning and design have have participated in the past. Um, but for now, I'll just point out that what I do actually think is really, really useful in the resilience framework that really comes from ecology is this thinking about adaptive cycles and I feel like uh, people used to look at me like I was a little bit crazy when I would talk. Oh, oopsie, just got a little excited with my mouse there. Um, uh, <laughs> when um, when I would talk about the uh, the the sort of cycles and thinking about how we may be in, in a time of, of conservation where we've increased our standardization and increased the way we codify things so much that actually we're not very adaptive to change and we're not very good at um, at, at you know, reorganization and redistribution. Um, but I think we all feel like we're in a bit of a back loop right now. There has been destruction and sadness and, um, and you know, uh, a lot of, um, of pain that we are all feeling. And there's a, there's a moment of um, creative destruction that we're in right now. And I hope that we can work towards pushing ourselves towards what regeneration looks like and actually think um, there's a lot of knowledge from the indigenous community world of thinking that um, that should be leading in, in those realms. So I'm super excited um, to learn. Um, I'll just say that in all of the projects that I looked at when I was doing this book project, they, they are all very different. But the thing they share is that they aren't one one organizational effort, right? It wasn't just like a, a savior planner or or designer who came in and made great decisions and solved all the problems. Um, and so when you see these projects that work really well from a ground up perspective where people are you know, sharing power and they're sharing decision making and they're sharing resources and they're building self-determination and, and capacity um, to choose, it happens partially because they're doing it um, as a constellation of actors working together towards a shared, a shared goal. The main things, if, um, just to give you like the summary of, of the book in, um, in a singular slide, um, is really about this, this sort of building of coalitions, uh, participating in, um, in collective material work um, in the Bayou Bayou project in East Biloxi. They actually really honor um, the, uh, the role that the oyster plays as an asset in their community. And so they built these gabion walls that could be easily recreated um, with uh, women that were learning the, you know, job training skills of, of ecological restoration, but also with community members that, that wanted to participate. And they kind of did this barn raising of, the, um, of, um, of this work using those um, oyster shells as the, as the mode of, um, of, of sort of craft. Um, but for lesson two, I'll just point out, when I say value, I mean like value, like actually pay people for their time. Um, this, is a, this is one that we can't wrap our heads around, but our budget should reflect our values. And so if you value people's effort, you should pay them um, for that effort. And, and this is just a big challenge in our field in general. We're a very um, white, affluent, male set of fields. And, um, and that doesn't mean that we don't have really important roles that, um, that white, affluent, male and female people can play in, um, in all of the solving of these problems. But we do have a responsibility to, um, well, we're, we're missing out, right? As if we're a heterogeneous Field, that means that we are learning together. We have a lot of different ways of, of knowing at the table. Um, and so, uh, whoops. Um, so, and I'll just say that part of that is because um, we have been really, really bad at sharing wealth in, um, in this country. And so we, since the civil rights movement, uh, this is all Urban Institute graphics, but, um, but we have actually had seen the you know the disparate impacts and the sort of rise of affluence in the white community um, and and that's partially because of the ways in which we participate in a whole bunch of systems um, that perpetuate um, you know affluence for for some and um, and really at the at the harm of others and so figuring out how we we look towards systems change I think is a is a big part of the work of designers and planners because how we accumulate wealth 
in terms of land is um, is just an enormous uh, part of um, you know of, of who uh, who who participates in in all these systems. Um, and these inequities are actually making us sick. So the social determinants of health are such a huge percentage of um, of you know how someone uh, is able to stay healthy and resilient, if, if for lack of a better word, to issues like um, the uh, pandemic that's hitting us all right now. So um, you know your own choices in terms of clinical care or access to clinical care is a, is a whole debate in its own right um, in terms of, uh, of, of who has limits. But, uh, but certainly um, the role that the built environment and, and other types of you know, manifested racism play, it's, it just has a huge effect on how healthy we are. So um, it hurts us all. Um, and thinking finally, I'll, I'll close uh, with, with just a, a you know, a call towards systems change. There are places like King County, Washington, um, that have been thinking about health equity and, um, and the entire um, stream looking upstream. And if you look upstream in these graphics, a lot of them are about the built environment and, you know, knowing that your zip code matters for how healthy you are. Um, there are ways in which governments have already been enacting these changes and, and we can be a part of that work. Um, it's now longstanding. Um, oh, and this is a bad version of this slide, but there's the iceberg metaphor is commonly used these days. And so I would just leave us and I'm going to pass the baton to Anna next, but I would just leave us with with a thought about looking at um, the, you know, not only the patterns, the disproportionate impacts, but also um, the systems that uh, cause these patterns um, to uh, to be maintained in the built world. Um, and I will pass the baton. Hi everyone, my name is Anna. I really appreciated hearing um, Barbara's presentation, which um, I think in what I'm going to, uh, the stories I'm gonna share, I think you'll see a lot of those big picture concepts, you know, manifested very much on the ground in uh, Flint, which is where I've spent a lot of time thinking and um, learning and being just generally obsessed. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick. There we go. Um, okay, so, so Flint, Michigan, um, just to give a little bit of a macro perspective, um, we're, we're, we're in the midst of the Great Lakes. We're in the midst of some of the most abundant resources of water on the face of the planet. There's more than one fifth of all the fresh water that you'll find on Earth is in these five Great Lakes. And inland, um, you're never more than six miles from a natural source of water. It is our abundance, it is our blessing, it is our beauty. You can see little Anna over there falling in love with it at a very young age. It's a very crucial part of our lives. And yet, we, a Great Lake city, um, just 70 miles from the shores of Lake Huron, um, 70 miles also in another direction from Saginaw Bay, a river town has become the face of a drinking water crisis. And it, it wasn't because of a natural disaster. It certainly wasn't because of scarcity. It wasn't even because of some corporations being um, obsessed with profits and mishandling public resources. This is a man-made, man, a series of man-made decisions that uh, put people in, in peril. And I think you'll see a lot of like, <laughs> well, I'll just get to it. I'll just show, show you what it is. So, um, Before you go on, Anna, I think you're yes. in presenter mode. If you could swap it over, we'll see the slides more fully. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It happens to all of us, truly. <laughs> is this better? Thank you, everyone. Um, so when uh, we're talking about Flint, I, I, I sometimes feel troubled when um, uh, it's only described as a city of loss. You know, it's lost so much people, it's lost public services, it's lost jobs. You know, Flint is the birthplace of General Motors has frequently um, become uh, sort of the face of deindustrialization. And um, uh, words like resilient and gritty get applied to the city a lot, which is true and beautiful in many ways, but also when it's the only way people know about it, I don't know, it, it sometimes feels a little bit uncomfortable, right? Like, like the, the one, like where, 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 the, the, where 
a kind of like fetishization of just people surviving hardships they never should have had to face in the first place. So when I talk about Flint, I do try to give a little bit of picture of what actually is there, the people there. It is the city of about 100,000 people. There are four colleges there. It's a county seat. It is um, a city where there's really lovely neighborhood cafes that um, are effectively hubs for community life. There's a very vibrant public library. There's people building playgrounds and um, taking care of each other um, uh, every day, every day. And it's, um, it's a place that deserves to have a future. It's also the place where this uh, very infamous um, uh, press conference happened <laughs> some years ago where the, where the city was, uh, when the city was switching its drinking water source. Now it had been getting water from um, Lake Huron for more than 50 years through Detroit's water department. The city had, was, um, at the time of the switch, was under emergency management, which meant a state appointed administrator had been sent to the city to have the full political powers. It was considered a city that was like in such dire straits that they needed this like outsider to come in and have full authority over all decisions made. Um, so the power that a mayor would have and a city council would have instead went to this emergency manager. Um, and they also had additional powers besides that no elected official has. Um, they were under a series of emergency managers for three and a half years and all of the decisions made um, in the course of this water switch happened in that, in that context. So that's really important to um, remember. A lot of times when people say shorthanded as Flint switched its drinking water, you know, we can poke at that a little bit. Like, did Flint actually have decision-making power here? They did not. They did not in any form. And, but anyway, the switch was happening um, and, and it was celebrated in many ways. So you can see in this, this image, the, the emergency manager, the mayor who only had as much power as the emergency manager gave him, city council members, environmental quality official, public servants, right? Um, and the idea is that this is gonna be a, a good for the city because it gives them more local control of their water. Like their idea was like they're going to switch their drinking water source, um, treat it at their rebooted plant for, um, uh, for a couple of years using their, the, the Flint River and then move on to a larger new uh, regional water source that was a water system that was gonna open in a few years. But of course things went very poorly. Now, one of the myths of the water crisis is that the Flint River itself was so polluted and toxic that it inevitably poisoned people. That is not true. Um, the Flint River does have some issues with it, but it is um, in much better shape than it, it has been in uh, decades past. It, um, uh, uh, it's uh, after being treated effectively as an open sewer like urban rivers all over the country, um, the Clean Water Act had a tremendous effect in, in, in improving its condition, as did, you know, with some ambivalent uh, deindustrialization in the city, um, as well as, you know, a lot of people who have been working very hard in um, environmental restoration and remediation there. So um, the Flint River was a more complex drinking water source to treat, but it was not so polluted it was going to poison people. The, the key issue here was the infrastructure and what was happening or not happening at the water treatment plant. So the, um, the, the rebooted plant did not have the uh, uh, staffing or resources needed to treat the water properly. Um, and most seriously, they didn't treat it with something called corrosion control, which is what you put in the plant, put in the water at the plant so that when it moves through what is almost universally old and deteriorating infrastructure, it helps protect the water from, from, from the metals that might corrode into it, okay? Um, and this is, uh, this is federal law, and not doing so was a violation of that. Um, and it's especially serious because uh, most, many of our pipes in this country are made out of lead, which is one of the world's best known neurotoxins. Zero amount, zero amount is healthy for people, is safe for human consumption. None. Um, so corrosion control doesn't entirely get rid of that problem. Really, we need to be getting rid of our lead-based infrastructure, but it does help and it didn't happen. Not for a short time, but for a long time. And every day that people weren't believed when they noticed that something was off with their water, 
is the day that this problem was worsening. So without corrosion control, the pipes actually corroded, right? This is, these are some actual pipes from Flint. You can see how they're literally breaking down. Um, the, the, when you saw images of people holding up brown or rust colored water, it was literally rust. It was corroded iron. The lead was not visible uh, to the human eye, but was very present, as was a number of other bacterial issues, um, and um, including uh, one, a waterborne bacteria that um, uh, caused a two-year outbreak of Legionnaire's disease, which is what actually killed people. And this is how we end up with the Great Lakes City, uh, a river town that, that learns that water is a threat, that water will hurt you, even kill you. Now to backpedal a little bit, um, I wanted to, when I was spending some time writing about this, I really wanted to put in context how a city becomes precarious like this, to be in a position where any of this happens. This is a picture of Flint in the 1960s. It had twice as many people, 200,000 people. It was growing very, very fast. This is why they hooked onto Detroit's water system in the first place. Huge company town with just tens of thousands of GM jobs there that was drawing people from all over the world. And it was also one of the most segregated cities in the United States. It was uh, uh, by one measure, the third most segregated and the most segregated in the North. Of course, this is reinforced by redlining, by restrictive covenants, by a number of um, ruthless policies at the public and private level that kept people of color restricted to two neighborhoods. As the population was growing, this was becoming increasingly impossible uh, to uh, manage as well as being immoral. So began a fair housing movement in Flint um, that was pushing back at this. Um, and it, it took a lot of different forms, sleep in on City Hall, a 5,000 person rally that was actually supported by Governor George Romney, a Republican, Mitt Stad, and one of the early secretaries of HUD. Um, it was um, something that was building out of um, a, a tradition of community organizing that Flint is famous for. In addition to being the birthplace of GM, it's effectively the birthplace of uh, the United Auto Workers. Um, this is from, these are images from the sit-down strike in the 1930s that changed the course of the 20th century. These are stories that are passed down generation to generation. You could see it again with the fair housing uh, fight, and you could see it in more recent years um, with the water organizers who well before the nation and world was paying attention to them or anybody was taking them seriously, were trying, working very, very hard to make themselves visible when again, their local votes were completely disempowered. And this is, and a miracle happened. Um, and it's a very long story, but um, Flint became one of the first, the first uh, community to pass a fair housing ordinance by popular vote. This was a big deal. This was 1968. Um, the National Fair Housing Act seemed like it wasn't going to happen for ages. It didn't end up being catalyzed until the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, similar ordinances had come up in cities like Seattle and Berkeley and Tacoma and Toledo. All failed. It passed in this company town of Flint, one of the most segregated in the country. That's a big deal and something to be proud of. But it was bittersweet. Two years later, the 1970 census was the very first that marked a downturn in Flint's population. Um, a down, uh, a, 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 a depopulation that is trend that has continued to this day. Um, so you can, what we end up with is this core city that is being um, increasingly hollowed out both by uh, economically with jobs and um, also uh, in the public sector with public services and with people. And you can see mostly it's white people who are leaving, right? Um, it is uh, uh, today about 54, 56% African-American, about 40% white, um, and, and also has a pretty sizable um, Hispanic population as well. Now, if you go to Flint today, you still see these like some dense neighborhoods. You can see these gorgeous old homes, the signs of the auto wealth of the past, but you also see the empty spaces, the remains of what people left behind, right? And this is what brings us back to the water story. Um, the neighborhoods like this one tend to be white neighborhoods and officially were white um, back in the day. Uh, these ones tend to be where more people of color live. And very practically, very literally, the water was worse in these neighborhoods than these. Now, everybody in Flint, everybody in Flint was um, a victim of this water crisis. 
but uh, the problems showed up sooner and more seriously in these neighborhoods because when you have vacancy, the, pipe, the water is sitting in those corroded pipes longer, right? So it's getting more saturated with all those uh, contaminants. Um, it's not moving back and forth as fast. It's covering longer stretches. Um, uh, uh, so this is why um, these folks who lived in these neighborhoods um, were uh, more vulnerable um, to um, what was a, a, um, a crisis that again, didn't have to happen. So I think I will leave it there and <laughs> pass it on to Tatewi and uh, look forward to talk about this more later with everyone. Thank you. Um, greetings, relatives. I shake each of your hands virtually um, with a, a good heart. Um, my name is Tatewi Means. Um, my full name is actually Tatuye Dopanajiwi. I was named after my paternal grandmother, and um, it means in the Lakota language, it means the woman that stands with the four directions. Um, Yes, it's my entire first name. So imagine having to fill out ECT bubble sheets and all of those kinds of things. It was a, it was a lot, it was a lot to learn. Um, but it is really an honor to be here with all of you and to share this space with this really esteemed panel. Um, I learned a lot already in, and I just wanted you both to keep going. Um, I can just be an observer by all means, but um, I'm really proud to, um, bring an indigenous voice and perspective to this conversation and um, appreciate the opportunity to do so. So often as indigenous people, um, we're invisible to the, the broader communities across this country. Um, you know, and even in thinking about in both of the presentations, of course, appreciate all of the information, but in all of the data that was presented, indigenous communities were left out, indigenous representation is is not included in a lot of those spaces. Um, and, you know, and talking about Flint's history, I was thinking, where were the indigenous people in that, um, in that process? Um, you know, who was advocating for them and with them? Um, and so I just really appreciate the opportunity to um, bring visibility to our communities and some of the strategies that we have found effective in, um, in resilience and regeneration. Um, so as mentioned in um, the introduction, I um, am the executive director um, for Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. I'm going to share a piece of our home and, and our community with you today. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that began in 2007. So we're just over um, 13 years old and definitely feeling the growing pains of a, of a teenager or adolescent. Um, we take a whole community approach um, through eight different initiatives. Um, and it's, it's really important that, um, you know, I speak about the work um, from a liberated point of view. There was a lot of conversation earlier around self-determination. And for Indian country, for indigenous communities, that it has a legal connotation as well. Um, you know, self-determination is defined in many federal laws and policies that pertain to Indian country specifically. So there's an Indian Self-Determination and Education Act um, that is particular to um, tribal nations in this country. Um, and sovereignty. Sovereignty is often associated with indigenous communities. And one, one pushback that we have, you know, from our perspective is Sovereignty, self-determination, liberation, those aren't things that are housed within institutions or within governments. They, they first start with the self. Self-sovereignty, self-liberation um, is the beginning of that ripple effect. It's the beginning of the movement that we are trying to create. And the very first step of liberation, you know, liberation is our vision at Thunder Valley CDC, um, is healing. And so what is tied to this work is at the foundation healing. And all of our work is really rooted in our language, our Lakota language, our spirituality, and our life ways. Um, we really try to stay away from the word culture. Um, in the Lakota language, we don't have a word for culture that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Um, the way that we say it is Lakowichoha, which is uh, a life way, a way of life. Um, 
I was just on a, a webinar presentation yesterday and the title of the presentation was Practicing Culture. And um, that is something that is also foreign to us because it's not something you practice, it's not something you think about after the fact or add on um, or check it off a list. It's a way of life, it's a way of being, and it's um, a way of thinking. And so on this liberation journey that we have um, in our community is really about changing mindsets. Um, you know, our people are, have been in such a state of persistent poverty, systemic poverty, that um, it's, it's become survival. Um, you know, in this topic of resilience for all, we are tired of living in a state of perpetual resilience and survival. It is time for our com communities to thrive. It is time for our communities to regenerate. So one component of our work at Thunder Valley is the actual construction of a regenerative community development. Um, we have 34 acres of fee simple land within the reservation boundaries, um, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And that is an important distinction as well because for many of you that may not know Indian country, at any given time, um, there are three jurisdictions that apply to Indian country. The tribal jurisdiction, state in given times, and then federal federal jurisdiction. So tribes in the federal system have concurrent jurisdiction. That's civil and criminal um, in a lot of instances. And so, um, you know, with us having fee simple land, it's not in tribal trust. Um, so there are state tax impl implications that result for our community, right? So all of these things are important considerations when you're building or designing and developing in Indian country. There are tremendous amount of infrastructure issues, so I can appreciate, you know, the struggle and the fight um, in Flint around those um, around those issues. And so, you know, at Thunder Valley on our 34 acres, it really is not building from the ground up, but from below ground up. Um, you know, and access to federal resources is limited. Obviously, it decreases um, year after year, and um, a lot of the work at Thunder Valley is really around shifting narratives um, about how our communities are presented, how we're portrayed, and how we are discussed. And a lot of it is educating funders, funders and partners and allies to our communities. And so one specific example, when we were applying for the USDA um, Rural Development Loan for the infrastructure development, they refused to include um, road paving as a part of our loan and grant package because they said, this is the reservation. There are dirt roads everywhere. Why would you need to pave, right? And so it's just, the level of um, uneducation, miseducation, or ignorance um, around indigenous communities is really profound. Um, it's inherent in a lot of the federal systems and programs. I mean, the very nature of having a Bureau of Indian Affairs, a federal office to manage the affairs of Indians is completely racist and um, insulting. Uh, you know, and, and when you grow up in this country and you're um, experience all of those things and you learn about things in that way, whether implicitly or explicitly, you develop a bias against indigenous communities and that notion that indigenous communities and people are inherently incompetent, right? And so the work that we do at Thunder Valley is constantly pushing back against those negative narratives, those deficit narratives about our communities. Um, you know, we, we pretty much wrote the book on resilience, how to, how to survive, how to bring back um, renewal, after a crisis, after trauma. And um, like I mentioned, we, oh, and the primary mechanism and the way that we've done that is through our spirituality. The fact that we are able to hold tight to our teachings and our language and our spirituality over hundreds of years of colonization is the, is the reason why we are still here today, is the reason why the resilience is strong. It's genetic for us in our communities. Well, like I mentioned in the beginning, we're tired of living in that state. We want regeneration, we want a renewal, we want to rebirth and rede redefine who we are in today's times as Lakota people, as indigenous people. So this is just a rendering of how our 34 acres will take shape. I mean, we've already began development. Um, we started with 21 single family homes. Um, we are a net zero ready community. So incorporating sustainable building practices and materials in all of the buildings. Um, this is an aerial view of, of current progress. So the 21 single family homes, a 12 unit apartment building, which is mixed income and uh, 
a community center and bunkhouse. We have a two and a half acre demonstration farm. We have over 500 chickens. So food sovereignty is, is a huge component to our liberation journey. Um, and you can see the design of the 21 single family homes here. Um, there's seven homes in each circle, in each Tioshpae. So Tioshpae in our language means family or extended family. So in each family circle, there are seven homes. And that's modeled off of the Ocheti Shakoni, um, who is the original inhabitants of this land base here. So seven, Ocheti Shakoni means seven council fires. There were seven bands within the Ocheti Shakoni. The Lakota were one of them. And um, this is how the traditional encampments were set up with seven bands in a circle facing the east to greet the sun as it rose. And so incorporating these traditional components into our design and plan is really important to us. Um, even in the design of our community center um, with the, the roof shape um, to represent eagles. Um, eagle is a very sacred animal to us as it carries prayers to the, to the creator. Um, you know, there's stone around the base of many of our buildings to reflect the traditional home structures as teepees um, with the wood um, extending to the top. And so, um, you know, we're, we're blessed to have um, design designers and planners on staff, um, many of them non-Indigenous, but have really done a lot of work at cultural competency and um, acculturation to Lakota values and value systems. Um, you know, and, and when we work with contractors, when we work with um, those that are off reservation and non indigenous companies, engineering firms, so on and so forth, when we're doing all of this work, we really hold tight to our expectations of what does cultural competency mean in our community. So one example is we're currently building a playground that is based on our creation story and one of our fundamental stories as Lakota people. Um, in the Black Hills, we have seven sacred sites. That's our, our spiritual homeland. Um, and so every play structure on the playground represents one of those sacred sites. So that while children and family are there, they are also learning and remembering who we are as Lakota people. Um, but the first drawings, the first renderings of that playground, we asked them to incorporate culture, Lakota culture. And what they came back was with was a medicine wheel and a star pattern. That in, in all the years, 30 plus years of working in Indian country in South Dakota with nine tribal nations in the state, their extent of cultural competency was, you know, stereotypical images you see associated with Indian country, a medicine wheel and a star pattern. Um, so, of course, that was not acceptable. Uh, we gave them, here are some books, educate yourself, educate yourself about Lakota people, especially if you're living here in our homelands. And bring us back something better. And so it took several um, iterations of that process to finally get to the point where they understood um, what we wanted and what we expected. And the finished product is something we're really, really proud of because it's, it's a true reflection of who we are. And so I think that's also important when you're working in you know, marginalized communities, communities of color, is they know their, we know our communities best. Right? And we are tired of having outside ideals and value systems and structures imposed upon us because what we know as Indigenous people is that mindset and that approach does not work for us. It is not something that is conducive to liberation. Right? These solutions and these projects in our communities have to come and be community driven. Um, so community engagement is really important to us as an org because we ourselves are no exception to that. We have to make sure that um, we are truly reflecting the needs of our community, right? And, and not take that really um, patriarchal approach to development and design that, oh, we know best, so we'll do this for the community. But really involving meaningful community engagement in this entire process. Um, so um, like I said, we have a whole community approach um, eight different initiatives, net zero ready community. We are currently in the process of a feasibility study for um, renewable energies for the remainder of the development to determine how we can um, ensure that we make our relationship right with Mother Earth, with the environment. You know, I spoke a little bit about the healing and the importance of that in this liberation journey and healing our relationship with Mother Earth is a, a fundamental component to that. You know, our our word for um, the earth mother is Unchimaka or grandmother earth. 
Um, and when you think about it in that way, when you think about the earth in those terms as a relative, it changes your whole interaction with, with the earth, right? Um, one of our values as an org, as a people, is being a good relative. So, um, you know, in, in a lot of our work, we just constantly questioning ourselves is, are we being a good relative to our people in the work that we're doing in, in the services and the programs that we provide? Um, you know, this, these are some of our young people that are in our Lakota language initiative. We have a total immersion Montessori childcare center um, where we're trying to create first generation Lakota language speakers to preserve that aspect of who we are. Um, so it's, it's, like I said, it's an honor to be here to share our work at Thunder Valley CDC um, and to, to share a bit of our home. So, feel my. Thank you all so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, who's listening that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you can offer questions to this group. Um, uh, but I wanted to start off with a question uh, builds a little bit off of uh, Tatewe with what you were just describing about, you know, the participation um, of, of designers and, and thinking about most of the people who may be listening to this webinar um, are work in the design field in planning or architecture or engineering um, or development itself. And, and I wanted to ask the group about this connection between design and community wealth. And, you know, I know in, in Barbara's work, she's, she's worked on the connection between green infrastructure and, and community wealth, and that there's an economic value to green space and healthy environments, and there's also a public health ramification of, of green infrastructure. And, and I thought listening to Anna, you know, there's a connection between public services and community wealth. And, and Tatewe, you're, you're talking about sovereignty and dignity and, and self-determination and that the connection, the, the opportunity for community wealth that is, you know, intertangled in, in those sorts of, of basic human needs. And I was wondering if you all I wanted to sort of present this to the group that if there was a reflection for the sort of, of participants, for the sort of listeners that the audience of this webinar might be, that they're in the design field and they, they have some opportunity to contribute to growing community wealth, what each of you might you know, recommend based on your work, based on your, your experiences and your background and, and you know, your, your focuses. I wanted to offer that up as a first question. Um, I just wanted to quickly respond to that. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've quite done talking for a long time, <laughs> so I want to share the space, but um, I think my first question is, what is the definition of community wealth? And so the challenge, I think, for each of us in that do this work is to let the community decide what wealth means to them. And it's not always in the context of the colonizer's language, right? And so a lot of the work that we do at Thunder Valley is pushing back against those um, the words that they use, you know, I heard power used a lot today. Again, we don't have a word for power. For, for us, it's all about balance, right? Because anytime you have power, it's a struggle because somebody has it and somebody doesn't. Somebody wants it, somebody takes it back. When you strive for a balance, everybody and everything has a place, right? We aren't at the top of the, the totem pole, the type of, top of the hierarchy. We have to find our place and bring that to balance. And so I think in building community wealth, like for us, that will look very different than um, even other tribal nations, than the Diné nation in New Mexico and Arizona. Wealth to us means very different things. You know, through our housing and home ownership initiative, where it does a lot of community education, those are a part of the conversations and making it relevant and resonate with our community because building a savings of 10% of your income every year to help towards a down payment for a home is not going to be a priority when it comes to summertime and we have all of our ceremonies because one of the greatest values that we have as a culture people is generosity. You give away. Um, the leaders of our communities were the ones that were poorest in the colonizers terms because you gave everything away to the people for the benefit of the people. And so I think it's so important to have those clear definitions and not impose them on the communities that you work with. That's a pretty incredible answer. So it's hard to add anything. It feels like it stands alone. Um, 
I will say that um, to use the Biloxi example, um, or no, actually I'll use the Portland example just to bring in a different part of the country, but um, they, so there's a living Coley project that is actually about using green infrastructure as a anti-poverty, anti-displacement tool. Um, and that is about making sure that the community has development rights on their parks, um, but also then um, opportunities to learn and benefit financially from um, the development of those parks. And, um, and so just really thinking through uh, how we seek balance um, and, and also self-determination in places where maybe the urban stressors are, um, some of them are actually about uh, being pushed out of your home if you're not accruing enough wealth to, you know, to pay your uh, rising tax bill and all those sorts of things. I'd, I'd finally just add to that. Um, I feel like we're coming, we're in a year where every community has had to reckon more literally than um, some have ever before with what is essential, right? What are essential services? And it turns out to be um, the stuff of life, right? It's water, it's food, it's shelter, it's health, it's safety. Um, these, are, these are some of the essential services that if nothing else, a community needs to provide for each other, right? And rely on, um, you know, in a give and take relationship. So um, I just wanna put that out there as something that um, might be some useful context for some of the, what the others are saying too. That's great. Um... It leads me, well, you know, Barbara, you brought up urban stressors and, and I'm sort of thinking about that, that terminology and, and wondering if each of you might want to sort of extrapolate that on that in terms of what it means for your own work. Um, you know, the, much like community wealth and much like this topic of language and, and what certain words mean and, and how the, how, what implications they have for your work. Uh, thinking of how each of you are are coming to this webinar from very different, say, professional practices, um, but but the term urban stressor may have very different implications in terms of what you're looking at, in terms of what you're studying, in terms of what you're uh, uh, responding to or supporting. So I'd like to offer that up as well. I can be brief since I brought the term up, um, since my fault. Um, but the, uh, for me, the reason I stay with that vague term is because I'm trying to make connections between the things that happen across a lot of different types of places, right? Even though the stressors might be really different, they have some shared themes. And honestly, I love um, the way that Tate, we spoke about, uh, about being a good relative, um, because in many senses, it's, it's related. We, um, at least, you know, in the communities I've come from, we don't think about it as poetically, but certainly when you look across the, you know, the United States at what we, when we do this well, it's because there are redundancies in terms of our social ties, like because we're strong. I'm using the word redundant because it's like ecological terms, but it's the same um, you know, we, we have, uh, it's funny because we call it redundancies and weak ties, um, but actually that's not what they are, right? It's like, it's the connections between, um, between people, between, you know, uh, animals and, um, and that seems to be what keeps you um, strong and able to heal, which I agree is a critical piece um, in, in despite whatever stressors come your way. You're talking about like coming from different vantage points, which I think is one of the interesting things that I'm enjoying hearing from other people um, today. I, I think just as a writer and as a, a citizen, right? I, you know, I live in communities that I write about. I think I th I've been thinking just a lot about um, just the potency of where the built environment and the natural environment meet. Um, and as a writer, I've spent, um, I write about many things, but I've, I've come, you know, over the years, I came to see myself as somebody who wrote about, like mostly about cities, about um, especially disinvested cities, especially cities that, um, where uh, concentrated poverty and austerity are like making so literal these crucial questions of what the common good is and what it means and what's at stake and all that. Um, and one thing that I kind of came to envelop 
me over the last few years, especially while um, focusing so much on Flint's story was like how being a city writer isn't this opposite of being as being an environmental writer, <laughs> you know, how it's how we're writing, how it's the same thing, right? And, um, and just, and, and, I, and, and also how like our built environment and the natural environment like makes so literal like we're never working from a blank slate ever, you know, like the, the weight of history is, is, is made manifest in our landscape. And so whatever choices we're making, whether people are practitioners in, in this sort of urbanist world or um, chroniclers of it, um, um, or just people, just citizens in it, um, I, I think like all our choices like come in that context. And I think having some intentionality with that is um, um, certainly important, but also, you know, is more beautiful and joyful. And, you know, like just, it, it, it gives a sense of connection even in places that I think have um, been made to feel very alienated. Well, and Anna, oh, sorry, Katiwe, please go ahead. Yes, I would love for you to. <laughs> um, when I think about that term or concept of urban stressor, stressors, I just think about um, you know, the need for us to, to think about our connectedness to one another, what is done in one place, whether it's urban or, or otherwise, always has an impact on those of us that are in rural areas, um, and especially indigenous communities, you know, the demand for fossil fuel and other extractive resources um, definitely harms indigenous communities and exploits the resources that we have. Um, in our land bases. And so, you know, pipeline struggles that, you know, make the news from time to time, but those are everyday realities for many indigenous communities. Um, because of the pervasive state of poverty, you know, those are really difficult questions for many indigenous communities and people to answer for themselves on <clears throat> the choice between employment or, you know, protecting the environment. And so, you know, those are choices we shouldn't have to make. Um, and so it's, it's really about that need for, you know, that broader education and willingness to see each other as connected in these spaces so that marginalized and indigenous communities don't bear the brunt of, of some of these decisions. Well, that was perfect because it ties up to something Anna had just said that I had seen a thread between all of your comments, which is I think, you know, sometimes we're maybe a little bit, a little bit cliche in describing storytelling and the importance of storytelling as, you know, sort of a, a, a tokenizing uh, approach to, to personalization and, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, the, I think, Anna, it was you that described, you know, our fetishizing of the struggle as a, as, as a nation of this, this focus on, you know, that the struggle is some, you know, unique aspect of, of what makes us who we are. And, and, and yet, I think the personalization is actually the important part. Tate, we, what you were just describing about the, the understanding of the connectivity between the urban and the rural, between communities that are quite different um, uh, in, in built environment and how they interact with each other and their decisions impact each other. And I wonder if, um, each of you might have some thoughts, some deeper thoughts about that, that interconnectivity and, and the role of understanding each other in, in better being able to, to, to serve that interconnectivity. I have, a, I have a thought on that just off, off the bat. Um, there's uh, the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about the danger of the single story. Um, she has a lovely TED talk about it actually, if people want to see it. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a key issue here. It's not that um, stories of struggle are um, inherently bad or wrong, you know, or untrue. <laughs> um, it, the problem is when it's the only story we're telling and we're telling it over and over and over and over and over again to the point where um, it is like people, it's just like a, almost like a fill in the blank thing. Um, and I think that, um, so I think, uh, you know, the way to counter that tendency is um, is of course like a multiplicity of stories, um, and that includes you know voices from and within the community um, and uh, the community that's being chronicled and so by outsiders so often, but also just like 
just like a, just a wider breadth and range, you know? I mean, like, I mean, I, I, I like do, do people, like if, if people are thinking about like the single story of Flint, like you already know it, <laughs> um, but like do people also know about like, you know, these other forms of community life that are part of people's like day to day? Um, or do they know like these like historic stories? Do they know these like funny stories? Do they know, you know, like the full range of the human experience like needs some room to breathe in these stories. So both as storytellers and, 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 and consumers of story, I think we have some responsibility to, to make sure that we're not, you know, falling into the, um, like slipping into like the single story, um, which even when it heroizes, you know, folks for surviving or whatever can still be quite dangerous and, and effectively erasing. Um, I'll just add briefly that um, I think Tete, we brought in the kind of uh, need to educate people on moving from a deficit-based mindset and um, I feel like that's inherent in your comments, Anna, is this, this notion of, of reduction, of flattening um, of our communities. And it's just a really easy thing to do. Even I study social movements and there are so many movements where you like, if you tell the story of the civil rights movement, it's a story about Martin Luther King. And like, he was an incredibly, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King was incredibly important a visionary human being, but he was part of a constellation of, of groups that, you know, evolved over time and right. And um, so I think uh, I just, uh, I think that focusing not only on reductive stories that are positive or negative, but also making sure that we're never falling into a deficit space trap, which our profession is just really good at. Like I use the language of vulnerability in the resilience for all. And I, um, I will, I have said many times and will continue to say, I really wish I hadn't done that. Cause I was just lazy of me. Like we shouldn't be talking about communities as, as vulnerable because that is a deficit based mindset. And we just, we should be better than that. Like there's no need to, to put people in, in those sorts of flattening boxes. I would absolutely agree with both of the comments that, um, it makes us one dimensional beings. And when you see people or you only hear about people in a one dimensional way, it's easy to dehumanize. Um, you know, and that's, and that's what we see a lot of times in our communities is that dehumanization continues and continues. Um, and so it's, it is, um, you know, in everyone's responsibility to tell a whole story um, from many different perspectives and to educate yourself about the whole story if it's not immediately available, right? The things we hear in the media, they tend to do that one dimensional approach. And so, you know, the challenge really for each of us is to take those extra steps to learn about the whole person, the whole community. Thank you all so much. I think that's a sort of a, a, a really poignant comment to, to end this on and really speaks to, you know, what I was so grateful about this collection of women speaking today. And I knew you all would, would bring that sort of diverse and, and, and uh, personal and yet holistic uh, approach to, to what we were discussing to resiliency. And, and so I'm, I'm very grateful to you all today. Thank you very much. Um, I want to remind everyone listening uh, that we have three webinars coming up. Um, as you can see here on the screen, the first is Welcoming Cities. Uh, that's going to be coming up on Wednesday, November 4th. And um, it's going to be a discussion on planning for in-migration and a welcoming way to under, uh, under unique and ever-changing circumstances to do so. Uh, quite a big uh, topic for us these days. Um, the, the next will be coming on Tuesday, November 10th, and Andres Duani will be speaking um, a bit about the CNU Charter, and we'll have more details about that soon. And the third on the docket is Tuesday, November 17th, uh, entitled Architecture in the City. This is a new um, series that we're going to be hosting through the On the Park Bench webinar. And it's an author's forum on urbanism. Uh, this will be with author Michael Dennis and interviewer Dan Solomon. So the link at the bottom of the screen, as you can see, is your uh, opportunity to, to check those out. We always get the webinars up within 24 hours after they've completed. So if you would like to uh, 
listen to this again. Uh, I certainly will because uh, some of the comments and, and lines and some of the slides were just fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to have to go back. Um, you can do so um, on our website. We also want to hear more feedback from y'all about what you would like to see on On the Park Bench. And so there's a link here on the screen. Um, the tiny URL is backslash OTPB feedback. So if you would like to add your thoughts about what you'd like to see or hear in future sessions, please let us know. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining today. I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Jocelyn and Dan, who, and, and of course, Lynn Richards, who spoke about our membership drive. And again, if you uh, would like to become a member, need to renew your membership, uh, or in any way uh, want to check in with Scott, he's a pretty good guy, um, I would recommend giving him a call. The number there is 973-714-7204. You can do this online at members.cnu.org as well. Uh, so again, thank you all. Uh, Tatewe Means, thank you. Anna Clark, thank you. Barbara Brown Wilson, thank you. It was a pleasure to get to do this today and, and listen to y'all um, have a wonderful discussion. And we'll see everyone uh, at the next webinar. Thanks so much. <laughs>